Hi everyone, welcome to Football Series and welcome to this episode on Uruguay, a country that keeps producing some top players again and again, even though their population is of only about 3 million. So in order to understand this paradox, I decided to contact Uruguay in football expert Alvaro, better known as at Uruguay Foot Ang on Twitter. Alvaro, before getting into it, could you please tell us a, a little bit more uh, about the type of content you publish out there? And you also have uh, a YouTube channel, don't you? Uh, yeah, of course. And Maxim, again, thank you so much for inviting me as well. I just wanted to mention that first. Um, yeah, so I just, um, over the last few years, I've been producing Twitter content. Uh, most of it has to do with uh, Uruguay's football history. Um, I just try to promote Uruguay's culture in, in, in general, while sometimes mentioning, you know, the, the present news, uh, any updates. Um, in terms of YouTube, YouTube is mostly focused on documentaries that I like to make. So my whole thing is I want to just kind of spread Uruguay's history and culture with football um, in English. English as well as Spanish. And yeah, I've, I've, I don't have that many videos. I think I have about maybe six uh, documentaries. They do take a while to make, usually about a month, month and a half. Um, and I can usually work on them in summer because that's when I'm off um, during mm -hmm. the summer. So yeah, usually once a year, I'll, I'll try to produce at least two to three documentaries um, Yeah, per summer. So guys, just, just go and follow him. You know, you know what you have to do, right? Yeah. Uh, now, when trying to answer my initial question we surely have to first understand the place football as in in uruguay and it seems it, it seems like there has always been a, a strong passion for the beautiful game in this country since they won the first world cup ever in uh, 1930 just after having won two olympic tournaments in a row yeah. and we shouldn't forget the, the 15 Copa america and the other world cup they won as well so Alvaro, which exact place has football in, as football had in in the Uruguayan society over time? It, it can't really be. I think okay. If I were to compare Uruguay, one of the interesting things I find is that I really try to look at Uruguay from an outsider's perspective. So I was raised in Canada, but I did get a chance to live in Uruguay. I was born in Uruguay. I did live there around age nine to ten, and you know, I, I did get another experience. Like I, I had grown up outside of Uruguay, then managed to get my way inside and really, I don't look at it in a way, it's kind of like through fresh eyes. And I was really amazed, to be honest, because uh, what I witnessed was nothing like anything that I had seen in Canada, and by extension, the United States, in terms of sporting cultures. And I just found out, like an, an enormous passion, um, an enormous um, amount of sacrifice by the population itself. And then I started realizing when, when looking back and talking to people, it's, it's that a lot of it is based on the history that you mentioned. And the history kind of has created this sort of like an emotional attachment with football. So there's, a, there's this really big bond with football uh, and Uruguay. And it really, it's sort of per permeated for the last, well, I'd say 120 years, very, very strongly in, in the culture. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the population and a lot of it has to do with sort of the, the narrative that has been built over the last 120 years. And this narrative is basically passed on from grandfather to father, father to son. I mean, literally, and I, I thought this was a thing that my father only did. But when I was growing up as a kid, my father would tuck me in and not tell me bedside, bedtime stories of, you know, Little Red Riding Hood or whoever, you know, he would tell me Uruguay soccer myths, like stories, you know, the last second header, you know, Esparrago to beat the USSR in the quarterfinals of the 1970 World Cup, you know, where he was, how the whole community was watching it so you know there's a lot of stuff like this that really i don't know it, it really binds you to a very i think unique football culture um and one thing I, i've told people you know when they when they mention this to me in general um it's like imagine what impact psychologically it would have to a very very tiny country if they won the first ever world cup just imagine like that automatically kind of like unites you to the game forever for the rest of history, you know, in that sense. And to Uruguayans, you know, it, the history didn't even start in 1930. It started in 1924. So Uruguay was already like as if they were three time world champions, FIFA world champions by 1930. And, you know, even back then they knew they had like only a population of about a, of about a million. That was extraordinary. And they were doing things, you know, winning multiple Copa Americas, beating Brazil, beating Argentina. So, you know, from the early outset, there was this big pride, like amount of pride associated with this tradition that was building and building and building. And like I said, every generation sort of like feeds on the previous one. And the idea is that they want to keep that mythology alive. They want to keep the narrative, the story 
you know, it's like a, to them, it's like an inspiring myth, basically what Uruguay can do. You know, the, the stories basically, you know, that children grow up with is yes, Uruguay can do it on the biggest stage. Look, we won the world cup. Look, we won all these Copa Americas, Copa Libertadores, uh, club world titles. It's like, you know, we beat uh, Real Madrid in 1966, Peñarol did it. So, you know, these kids who were growing up playing football, they're constantly living in this reality of this history that never really died. It, it's like alive today as much as it was in 1966 or you know 1950 1924 etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know it's um like i said it's it's all like a big big culture that has been sort of built together and like i said you know the people have a very strong emotional investment in continuing that story and that culture i find um i mean i have so many <laughs> i have so many notes here but like you know one of the things i could even talk about is um like there's a very, very big spiritual impact in the game. Um, have you heard of, I mean, I'm sure you've in Europe, you know, people know about the All Blacks in New Zealand, right? The rugby team? Probably yeah, heard, yeah. The famous well, Academs, right? Oh, oh, absolutely. It's massive, right? But the thing is, you know, I mean, this was about maybe three, four weeks where I was talking to, to someone from England and they told me that some people, I don't know if this is true, but he said in England, they see like there is a relationship between New Zealand rugby and they see Uruguay in, in football. And it's not just the population. It's like there's this sort of like larger than life culture to the team, to the national team. And that's what I, I see in New Zealand as well, like that it means so much to these people. It's not just, you know, you're putting on the black jersey and if you win, you win. If you lose, you lose. It's like it actually they when they go play for the jersey, they think about their grandparents who were national team players, you know, their great grandparents who are following Uruguay as well. So there's a very, very big spiritual component, I think, as well. Um, and I think, I don't know, um, I think, the, for example, if I were to give you um, an emotional outburst that occurred this week, I know that was very, very interesting. Benfica lost, I'm sure you've heard, to Liverpool, um, you know, pretty, I won't say convincingly, I think it was 6-4 on aggregate. Uh, they tied 3-3 three, three at Anfield. So the camera shows Darwin Nunez, and he's like on his knees, just bawling, crying, 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 crying. And the announcer on the zone, the, the channel, the app that I watched it on, he was actually saying like, oh, how strange, how strange that he's, he's taking this so personally, so seriously. And I'm watching this with my father, and I was like, no, this is this is how they're raised. Like, it's, it's devastating for them. Like, they're not even thinking of the, oh, I already made my money. I got my goal bonus. He's thinking of, of in terms of the mythology of football. And it's very interesting that I find the adults – who are supposed to be cynical, they are in a sense, you know, it can't get corrupt and it can't get, you know, terrible in a sense, football, the footballing world. But the players in Uruguay, I find that they maintain this idealism or this sort of like amateur spirit, um, even throughout their career, which, which I find fascinating. And like I said, um, unlike anything I've seen growing up in, in North American sports, like without a doubt. And Darwin Nunez would have surely cried uh, a lot more if he was wearing the, the Celeste jersey, right? <laughs> With, uh, yeah, without a doubt. Um, <laughs> you know, if you remember 2018, they yeah. showed uh, Jose Jimenez when Uruguay was losing 2-0 to France. But 10 minutes to go, he just collapses on the field, like 15 <laughs> minutes to go, crying. So you have Muslera and Diego Di picking him up, and, and it showed. I mean, you know, I don't know, it just... <laughs> really showed what it meant um you know not to because i know you know one of the themes i find in terms of uh south american national identity is an idea or any national identity is like is like uh, exceptionalism like oh we are special because we are different in this sense but th th like I i've seen actual evidence and a long time ago diego lugano i'm sure you've known him he's he was a uh, uruguay's captain 2010 world cup and you know, <laughs> for one match in 2014 until you know he he couldn't play anymore um he said once that um he was when he was in Fernando Bacci around 2009 like the players would actually go up to him and ask him it's like oh you guys are like so into this like even internationally like this is like the world for you like not to us like it was just he was saying that people were asking him like why why do you guys care so much like it's so so personal like you guys were you know you were gonna leave on a 3 a.m flight just to make it a little bit earlier it's like bro we don't you know so he didn't want to say who said that to him that he was basically saying we don't really you know we're not that into it but i thought it was interesting that he was even mentioning that as well because like i said i see it from my perspective and um you know when i went to uruguay um you know when as a child i remember thinking oh i guess i guess all the soccer nations are like this like i i remember thinking that when i left you know i, I got here in canada for example they'll make a big deal if like 60 fans go to a, a, a to no way stand basically if toronto fans go to montreal and like 50 people go that's like a huge deal and i, I remember thinking that 
things were so different in terms of the passion, in terms of, you know, the 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 level of investment in general in Uruguay. But I remember mis- mistakenly thinking that, oh, I, I guess it's all like this, just with soccer in general. But it wasn't until I, I got to really look around and, and I noticed, yeah, no, this is like, I don't know, there's a there's a lot of sacrifice involved. That's that's what I'm trying to say. A lot of mm-hmm. a lot of emotional investment and yeah, commitment is is the word basically. Yes. Yes, because doing my research, I, I faced several times the, the expression that surely best describes the, the embodiment of the the passion Uruguayan people have for football, the so-called uh, Garra Charrua. In, yes. in English, it would mean something like Uruguayan fighting spirit, I, I, would, I would say, but you'll surely be able to complete this definition above all the, the one of the word Charrua, right? The, that, what does that mean, uh, yeah. Uruguayan? Is it from, no. from the Indian? Uh, yes, that's yes. Is. That's exactly it. So essentially the uh, original native population uh, in Uruguay were called the Charruas. And the Gara Charrua, I, well, the literal translation is the Charrua Claw. So um, mm. essentially, you know, there, there was actually a really interesting interview by a journalist, a British English journalist called Tim Vickery. I think he's great. And he he's South America is one of, you know, the main uh, journalist in South American football as well. So he once had a, a podcast and he said that he thought that the Garra Charrua was like a, an example of cultural appropriation. So basically he saw it in, in a way as if saying that, you know, this, uh, p- this, these people that is essentially replaced the Charruas now are taking their traits and sort of embodying them. So he was saying this in a sort of a, in a more negative way. And, and it, you know, in a sense, I, I did see that he had a, a point in that sense. But the way that I find Uruguayan Sidagarra Charrua isn't really as if they're embodying the sort of spirit of the natives that used to exist. So the idea was that these natives were very, very brave, very, um, well, essentially brave. They were very, very, you know, praised for their courage. What I view is that it's more of um, an admiration of the Charrua spirit that they witnessed. So they call the spirit that they want to embody in in this football sense it's sort of like a reference to that but it doesn't mean that they feel as if they're charruas if that makes sense mm-hmm. so you know I, I just thought it was an interesting point that tim vickery did make but i wanted to clarify that it's you know the garra charrua it's not you know when you think the garra charrua the thing that i i believe in my opinion maybe i'm wrong um it, the thing that does it, that comes to their minds the uruguayan is not that they imagine themselves as being like a, a charrua or kind of like a mexican might my, my think of as an aztec mm-hmm. warrior or something that they're embodying like a japanese with a samurai it's it's more like you know they think of it strictly in football terms so the garra charrua is really a tradition um of bravery in the football pitch basically um, but more bravery than usual so if i were to give you an example uh in 1962 in the final match of the group stage uruguay plays the soviet union and they had to win the match to qualify to the next round very early in the game one of uruguay's wing backs and i I, the name escapes me right now i should have written him down he breaks his leg and we're not talking like little fracture we're talking leg is like hanging he refuses to get subbed off and he spends the rest of the match hopping on one foot just to bother the soviets just to have an extra body on the field and i thought you know that is considered one example of extreme commitment but it shows like wow like you know what i mean it's um like when he did that, he no doubt would have thought of other examples as well that Uruguayans did. And the thing is, Uruguayans are very big on passing these myths and these stories on to the next generation to inspire them. Um, so, like I said, the Garra Charrua, it, it really means a lot of things. One of the things that is interesting is that the, I think the meaning of the interpretation of it has changed over time. So when I was growing up, um, the interpretation of Garachorro was more of a Uruguay will outmuscle you, Uruguay will outman you in a way. Like they're more masculine. Like they're going to come in and just wipe the, the the pitch with you guys. They're going to come in high tackles. You'll elbow, you'll elbow them in the face. They'll come back with an elbow even even harder to you. So the idea was that Uruguay, um, there was, a, I think, a false interpretation that a lot of Uruguay's successes were done because of this sort of overly physical element of Uruguay's football style. But then, lo and behold, uh, Oscar Tabaris came, and being an educator that he is, you know, he used to be an ex-teacher, he, um, he kind of took the country in around 2009, 2010, and he kind of actually reframed the Garacharrua, and I believe that that version is what we have now. 
And in a way, what he did was he said that, listen, guys, no, the garage order was never what we thought of it in the 70s and the 80s, and even in the 60s, partly. Like he says, before that, like Uruguayan football was known for, you know, bravery, but fairness, respect, humility, you know, and I think he he mentioned very emotional stories. For example, um, in 1954, Uruguay played a, a pretty famous semifinal of the World Cup against Hungary, very famous Hungary team. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, the Magyars 1954 you know, a lot of Real Madrid players, a very, very formidable team. Mm -hmm. And the match was so emotional. They went to 120 minutes. And as soon as the final whistle blew, one of the biggest stories that he shared, Tavares, was that Pepe Schiaffino, who was the World Cup winner in 1950, he grabbed the Hungarian captain and kissed him on the forehead, congratulating him and gave him a big hug. And, and the whole team was embracing the Hungarians. And you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, oh, the match ended in a mass brawl. You know, players were being chased with corner flags. You know, let's go Uruguay. Uruguay no ma. No, it wasn't. It was a sense of humility. It was a sense of, you know, I don't know, just absolute respect between both teams. And basically he passed that on. And yeah, the idea is that lately the Garracha Rua is, is meant to mean, you know, never giving up, really, you know, fighting for all you have. But, in um, you know, there, there's another aspect of it as well that I could mention that I find very interesting. But, but like I said, it's also taken on this very, I think, very positive uh, aspect in the last few years. And I think I think you can see it, actually, to be honest. Um, you know, li little examples like if I could mention um, 2016, Uruguay were eliminated uh, by Venezuela in the Copa America. Philadelphia, I actually went to that match. So mm -hmm. I drove about 12 hours to just have about 50 Venezuelans scream a goal in my face. <laughs> so 12 hours there, 12 hours back. And uh, but at the end of the match, the first thing Tavares did was he had his, you know, his little car because he couldn't walk at the time. He, he just kind of rode his way to the Venezuelan captain and immediately offered his hand and hugged him. And so I'm just saying, like, there was, you know, your way could have been furious and, you know, whatever and made a scene. And no, they were just very, like, humble and, and, and hugging the Venezuelans. And like I said, it's just it, it's, you know, it's something small, but I think it made a huge difference in the perception, I think, of the Garracha Rua in general. Okay, very interesting. Uh, I didn't know um, Tabaris reestablished the, the real, real version of this uh, of this yeah. Gara Chara. And uh, I've read, I've precisely read that this Gara, Gara can already be seen at a very young age on a football pitch in Uruguay. Yes. Then yeah. it seems like competing is at the heart of the so-called yeah. baby football, which might precisely be the the secret behind Uruguay's talent factory. Could you please uh, please tell us uh, more about it? But, yeah. but first of all, what is even baby football, baby football? Yeah, absolutely. So baby football is absolutely integral in terms of Uruguay's entire football pyramid. And I mean, beyond integral. Um, so roughly there are about 65,000 uh, children playing uh, every weekend in Uruguay, which per capita is considered like a significant amount. Um, Between so the, the idea that I read was that between ages six to 13, four out of 10 males are playing Bobby football. So it's almost very difficult. It's rare for a male uh, to not go into the system because like, it's so popular. It's almost like a an integral um, aspect of the community, you know, of the child's community up, upbringing. So sometimes it's funny. I talk to my father and like all of his friends and everyone had a Bobby football team. Like they're all, everyone's very, very involved in this sense. It is a very, you know, a nationwide program. So essentially it's all done very competitively. There's no recreational aspect about it. And like I said, they, they try to instill this garra mentality to children. And I had, a, I had friends of mine kind of jokingly say that whenever I show them the, the Bobby football clips, it, it reminds them of like Sparta, you know, the, the idea of like Spartans training the children, it, it, it's like a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the movie 300, I, I know there's, you know, it's a very, uh, you know, fictionalized version of what happened with Sparta, of course. But the, the idea that I found fascinating was that, you know, it's such an ingrained culture, it's cyclical, you know, the, the adults get the kids now and they, 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 you know, impart this knowledge and this ideology and this, this behavior, um, you know, this way of feeling the game. And, you know, the kids are very, very into it as well so one of the things you'll notice right away is that it's actually full contact which i remember reading once actually maybe i didn't read it i think it was a fifa tv documentary and i said that the only country i think that allowed contact at a young age was like germany and that was only like age 12 Uruguay is like age six. Oh no, they're flying tackles. It's like, absolutely. And you know, it's just accepted. I, I remember playing Bobby football. I was 
eight years old, when I went to a year where to live for about that year, eight to nine years old. And I was amazed. I'm amazed at the, not just the way they played, but the little cultural aspects of the game in the pitch. And this is compared to anything I experienced in Canada as well. So you'd have like a player would like really foul a guy and he's really injured. And I'm, I'm, you know, Canadian. I'm running to the player, go, Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? And and the, the other kid's like, no, 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 no. You gotta let him get up on his own. It's, it's like a, it's like a, a guy thing. Like, no, no, no. You, you can't let, you'll embarrass me if you help him up. I mean, I'm just saying it was very interesting seeing so many aspects of this or, you know, like I said, it was not uh, recreational. So you had to be careful. You could get tackled hard. It was very, you know, normal. And well, the thing is, um, yeah, like I said, it's highly competitive. There's, there's over 600 clubs in the whole pyramid. And the idea is, um, yeah, essentially, you know, you work your way from Bobby football and eventually you can, if you're lucky, um, get scouted by clubs that are nearby. So the, you know, there's actually a really interesting, um, there's a French uh, youth coach who is living in Uruguay now. So he actually was one of French's youth coaches for 30 years. And now he's working for Nacional. And I actually saw an interview where he talked about Bobby football and he was just saying, yeah, he was just saying how amazed he was by the, the high competitive physical nature of how you know young the players are um but basically he was just saying in in general that um yeah the the spirit of bobby football you just feel it with everything around it so you'll have women men grandparents like almost every aspect of the neighborhood in these places it's almost like a tradition you go on the weekend so everyone's really really into it very invested in this you know and yeah i don't know there's there's a lot of culture with these clubs as well right obviously so like I said, it's become a very important part of Uruguay's football culture, um, especially, yeah, like I said, discovering uh, the next generation of players who, by the way, if you watch, there's a few documentaries. Um, if you watch the players from Bobby Football after the match, they say, who, who do you guys want to be when you grow up? And all of them are saying Cavani, Suarez. So like I said, the, the, the excitement of the real world football kind of feeds into the, the children who are coming in as the next generation of, uh, well, hopeful <laughs> professionals, you know, if they do make mm -hmm. it, that's the thing, right? So, and and it's already at a at a very yeah uh, very early age in, in fact and um yes. i wanted now to to move on to another football paradox yeah. related to uruguay the, the geographical one because even if about 60 percent of the country's population and almost all all clubs of the uruguay's first division are are to be found in the montevideo metropolitan area a lot of players come from the interior uh, el interior which li literally means the the inside uh, a word used to talk about the part of the country which which isn't next to the sea and i have to mention that at least the best known ones here uh, such as suarez cavani jimenez godin bentancur stuani uh, torreira naitan nandes and, and vecino so what's so special about growing up in in the interior, I know it's a, a difficult question. Oh, I mean, you know, I actually, when I saw this question, uh, this, like when I was actually reading the questions, I, I actually made a call uh, to a Uruguayan friend of mine, because he's a little much older, and I wanted to ask him, you know, what, what he thought about this. So the, the idea is essentially that there's no exceptional reason, um, except for the fact that you have a lot of grass in the interior. So, for example, if I were to give an example here where I grew up in Toronto, I mean, I'd have to, I, I, I wouldn't even know where to find a football pitch. But in Uruguay, it's a lot more common in Montevideo, but even more common in the interior. So, you, you know, the lack of cement, a lot more, you know, a lot more places to practice and to grow, obviously, um, you know, your, your, your one's skills. Now, the, the idea is that the success of Cavani and Suarez that has essentially and almost inevitably led to a massive growth in interest. I mean, there already was the interest, but now there's a belief, you know, you're seeing, I mean, pretty much, I mean, what you named just now is more or less a starting lineup for the national team. You know, Vecino, if he doesn't play one game, he plays the other. So he's, he's a very regular player, Torreira as well, although lately he's been a substitute. But yeah, essentially the, the idea is that, um, you know, the success of Suarez, Cavani, Torreira, you have uh, Darwin Nunez, Casamartigas. So a, a a lot of, you know, a lot of this is feeding back into the players and, you know, they've not, uh, you know, lost note of this. I mean, you can, if you go to Salto now, there's Suarez and Cavani are everywhere. They even have a statue of Suarez there as well. So, you know, it, it's very um, prominent, I think, in the psyche now that, uh, you know, that this success is breeding in a way, maybe, hopefully, for, for from our perspective, more success, more enthusiasm. But yeah, like, honestly, I, I ask a few and the idea was basically, well, 
you know, it, it's sort of 50 50. Like you do have as many players come out from Montevideo as you do from the rest of the country. Um, I know that Tabarez, uh, ever since I believe this was 2011, they started a program to actually go out into the interior to spread the game more, which is pretty amazing, I find, to think that Uruguay's most of Uruguay's history was because people say three million, but a lot of it was mostly Montevideo. So we're talking really, it was a million point something. Um, but now it's, yeah, like I said, the interest in the interior interior is growing massively um case in point um about maybe six months ago i was contacted by a chinese company that were interested in purchasing a club in the interior of uruguay and i might be getting ahead of myself but one of your questions for later was about torque and they were mentioning torque like oh it's been a massive success we can see the investment paying off they sold this player this player so people are knowing and they're you know finding out about this but he was also mentioning oh Cavani, uh, Suarez, why doesn't Salto have a first division team? Can we make one? Blah, blah, blah. So like I said, it, it seems almost like the interior is this undiscovered potential that I think people are realizing now. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we, we can find players here and no one's taking clubs here. You know, guys, this is, yeah, this could be big. So it, it just seems like it's, it's, it's in the focus now. And yeah, I have, uh, like I told you, I've had evidence of that interest actually mentioned to me basically. Um, so yeah, if I were to, to summarize, I would say the like, m- mixture of enthusiasm, increase in spending and investment recently, and also just the advantage in general, right? Having all that space, all that grass, everything, right? Less obstacles, basically. Okay, thank you for your insights here. 